All right, um, so to our remote locations, shout out across the board to the rest of the group that's out there and everybody. Um, so I know I've called out uh, Atlanta, I know I've called out Canada, uh, I think if I haven't yet I should definitely have called out Belgium, our crew over in Asia, um, I'm going to call out one person by name, uh, so Scott Moss, uh, definitely hello to you out in the Atlanta group out there. Uh, so where we're at right now is, uh, first off, for the folks here in Irving, reminder, if you're going to be in the uh, drawing that we're doing for the MMS badge out of the, the Irving location, you need to have your business card put in the fishbowl between now and the Q&A session, which is going to be coming up in a little bit. All right. So reminder on that. Um, let's see. So to Amelia, do we have uh, giveaways that we're doing right now? We do. We have signed copies of several of the System Center Unleashed books. So, Excellent. Carrie, you want to come on over? Yeah, we'll have Carrie. Um, if you want to meet Carrie after I call out the ticket, you can meet her outside at our booth and have her sign your book. So. All right, one second. So anybody we'll who is outside right in. now, we are drawing. So you may want to keep an ear out and make sure that you've got your numbers available. Okay, so I'm going to call out five numbers. The first one's 209 212. All right. 209 212. All right. What about 209 198? Anybody? 209 198. Two zero nine one zero six. All right, I'll just keep pulling some numbers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got one going? All right, so we got one so far at least. That's good. Got to start going. Okay, cool. All right, and again, to anybody who's outside, we are drawing right now for free stuff. Oh, well, yeah. Then <laughs> oh, great. Perfect. All right, do you guys want to head outside? If you want to just head over to the catapult booth out in the hallway, if we call your number, and you can meet with Carrie and pick up your copy of the book. Um, the next number is 208972. 208972. Anybody? We got, we got do one. we have a winner? All right, excellent. Woo, we got all a right. second. Excellent. Go ahead and meet them outside. Go ahead and follow them outside if you just uh, just drew a winning ticket. Uh, follow Carrie and the gentleman we're just heading out right now. Okay. <laughs> we'll also do um, 209013. 209013. Anybody? You know you can also just pretend you won. That's also an option. Uh -huh. Just Hold jump on. up who, and claim Who wants it? to pretend? Who wants yeah. to claim? All right, get up. There you go. Hold on. I saw this guy right here. Just a second. Hold on. And we'll see who... Well, we got to have a new ticket because he had that one. So let's see All who right. got this one. Hold on. Okay. So first to have it or pretend they did wins it. Hmm. 209655. Woohoo! I see this dude <laughs> right here, right here, up front. Excellent. How many more do we have? I think we've got one more. All right. So we got to see who's got this random number that's being drawn. What do we got? Two zero nine zero seven four. That dude right there had his the hand up right front there. before it even got called. He was psychic. He's in. He's the man. That's over. Right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Good job, everybody. Excellent. All right. So, uh, again, to everybody on our live feeds and the rest of it, uh, thank you all for hanging with us throughout the day. Um, hopefully you have uh, been having a good time with this. Hopefully you're enjoying what you've seen so far and learning some good stuff. Um, what I can tell you is that our next speaker is somebody that you do not want to miss. Um, so if you're interested in what System Center does, uh, if you're interested in what Orchestrator does, this is a session that you're not going to want to miss. Um, so first off, I get to make an announcement, which I thought is pretty cool. Um, so for those of y'all who don't know, or all y'all who don't know, um, so I uh, blog on systemcentercentral.com. It's a website where I actually do most of my technical postings at. 
Um, and System Center Central is actually run by Pete Zerger, who's in the audience today and will be your speaker here in a couple minutes. Uh, so Pete actually was nice enough to let me make the announcement for the fact that the brand new, completely rewritten version of System Center Central will be coming up this weekend or before. So completely code rewritten, whole new design and all the rest of it. I've been taking a look at it before it comes out. It looks really good. So that's one announcement that could hit the Twitter feeds at this point in time. Brand new System Center Central coming effective this weekend. So now with that, it's time for me to introduce Mr. Pete Zerger. Um, so Pete needs to come on up here. I'm gonna throw him under a couple of quick buses here. So first off, uh, Pete is a cloud and data center specialist MVP. So part of the same group that, um, that I'm part of as well, who report under Travis. Um, Pete has been a great sport as we have been making jest of him throughout the day for those who are following the social media feeds, comparing him to Jeff Goldblum, and I'm not sure who all else, but you all can see kind of the whole Jeff Goldblum look here. So. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Mr. Pete Zerger. So, kicking. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. I'm used to being made fun of. You guys can bring it. So I've already had warnings of, of hecklers. Uh, so uh, shout out to everybody out there in the ATL, in APAC, in Belgium. You guys are great sports. I know it's late. Uh, I think right now it's something like... 4.30 in the morning in APAC, so I don't know how many people are actually awake and, and watching over there. I'm guessing Ray might be over there. Uh, so, a lot of great sessions today. You had a couple, of, a couple of pretty deep dives. It's always cool to hear Wally talk. I think uh, Travis kind of set my brain on fire with, uh, with service manager reporting, and I figured being the guy, you know, driving the caboose here, uh, that you might be burned out on some of the deep tech. So I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit and we'll talk, uh, I'm going to, I guess, begin by telling you what I'm not going to talk about. Uh, I know some of you out there were here last year and you've probably made some strides with Orchestrator. Some of you, you know, may be brand new. Uh, so I'm not going to talk to you about how to build runbooks. I'm going to talk to you about how to be a better orchestrator. I'm going to give you some information uh, that I hope in the next hour you can assimilate and go back to your organizations and, and really use it to exhibit some thought leadership in helping your organizations uh, approach uh, Orchestrator with a fresh mindset. And if you're an expert, uh, you know, I hope I give you some, uh, some new ideas, uh, you know, some new techniques that will help you. Uh, you'll be a bit more effective in how you approach uh, the orchestrator component when you're working in your, uh, your enterprise. Um, so let's start with an intro. How are we doing, Hal? How are we doing, Hal? Good evening. Everything's running smoothly, and you? Well, everything is running smoothly, Hal. I'm in the center. So let me just take a poll out there of, of those of you that are with me. How many of you would consider yourselves orchestrator experts? So don't be shy, give me a show of hands. Okay, how many of you have built a few run books, maybe, you know, done a virtual lab? Give me a, a show of hands. All right, and so how many of you are newborn babes that have never cracked the, uh, the run book designer console? That's what I'm talking about. You're my people here today. So, so I don't care if you've been using it for, for 15 months or 15 minutes. Uh, I hope to leave you with at least one thing before you walk out the door um, that will help you be more effective as you approach Orchestrator in your organization. So, you know, I named this session 2013 and Orchestration Odyssey for a very good reason. So if you go to the dictionary, an odyssey is described as a long and arduous journey uh, with often many uh, reversals in fortune. You know, some, some good, some bad. Um, it's also described as an intellectual or spiritual journey. Now, if orchestrator is a spiritual journey for you, I'll say that it's okay to like orchestrator, just don't like like orchestrator. Uh, but that question comes up, where do we begin? And an odyssey is only effective if we're running in the right direction. And I will say I've seen some organizations do great thing with orchestrator, and I've seen a couple of fantastic uh, disasters. Uh, and, and you don't want to be the one that wakes up and pops out of that rabbit hole and says, you know, I knew I should have turned left at Albuquerque. And if you don't understand that reference, shut up. 
Um, so let's start with, with just uh, maybe a reset on our frame of mind. So we're all familiar with the people, process, technology uh, triangle, right? And as IT people, a lot of times we're focused on uh, you know, being as strong as we can be in the technology and you know, automating to the maximum degree the law will allow, right? And to be really effective with Orchestrator in your environment, I think it takes uh, uh, just a reset on how we approach it. So, so we want to go from this to this. I want to think about the technology as a secondary component that's going to support my primary focus, which are the processes that I'm trying to automate and the people that are intertwined with those processes. The people who, uh, you know, there's always going to be a need for smart people with the right training sitting in the chair to hit the approve button, right? There are people that I need to notify at the right junctures to make sure that my orchestration is uh, driving, uh, you know, driving processes but not creating questions and confusions uh, in the process. So before we even get into how do I start with Orchestrator, I want to just introduce you to a game that we play, that I, that I play in, in class with some of my students when we're learning Orchestrator, uh, some of my new team members. You remember that show, Name That Tune, back in the 60s. So I, that was before I was born, incidentally. But, but uh, you know, one contestant would say, I, I'm going to name that tune in five notes. And then somebody else would say, I can name that tune in four notes. And whoever uh, was lowest, they would get to go first and try to name that tune. So we play a game uh, that we call, I can do that in X number of activities. And we take a real problem and we try to solve it with as few activities as humanly possible to meet an effective end. So I was playing this game with a couple of guys in New York uh, recently. We installed Orchestrator and uh, they said, okay, let's automate something. And I said, okay, give me a target. And they said, we want to send the alerts from SCOM, which we had just set up, we want to send those over to our ticketing system. I said, do you have System Center Service Manager? And they said, no. Uh, how many of you out there don't have System Center Service Manager as your CMDB today? So if you're not a Service Manager customer, I'm guessing that's going to be a significant minority to a, a small majority. And that's cool. We're going to talk about that problem here in just a little bit. So. Most ticketing systems, uh, whether it's enterprise or not, have one thing in common, right? They can accept an email message in order to create a ticket. And, you know, from the crappiest SMB solution up to all of those other acronyms that compete with System Center, uh, you know, generally speaking, the subject line of my message is going to be the ticket title and the description is going to be, you know, the message body is going to be the description in the incident uh, that I create. So what we did, uh, I said, guys, I can do this in two activities. Um, and the first of those I got from the, uh, the Operations Manager Integration Pack, released by Microsoft Native 2. Um, hey guys, I don't think we can see my demo screen. Can you flip over to the, uh, the other screen? Perfect. Okay. So here in my Runbook Designer, over on the right-hand side, you see my activity. Some of those are standard activities that are completely product agnostic. I have quite a few system center specific activities in the form of what we call integration packs. So with Operations Manager, that integration pack gives us a lot of options for working with the alerts uh, that are raised by our monitoring system and also to deal with maintenance mode, you know, turning off monitoring at strategic junctures. So the obvious place for us to start with these guys was with the monitor alert activity. And so I drug that out onto the pallet, uh, connected it to my SCOM server and said, okay, what alert would you like to forward over to your ticketing system? And so they said, okay, let's start with DHCP service stopped or logical disk free space. I, you know, frankly, I don't even remember what it was. So they gave me a target. Uh, and I said, okay, we're going to watch for new alerts with this. You can see it's pretty straightforward. I can actually add uh, all sorts of properties from my alert and filter however I like. So we filtered on the title, pretty straightforward. One of the uh, standard activities in Orchestrator is a send email activity. Uh, pretty uh, simple activity to configure. It just wants to know what SMTP server it's going to use, what's the to address, what's the from address, and give me a message. So what makes Orchestrator so powerful, though, is I don't have to hard code all of this in advance. I can configure uh, this runbook to consume information from the previous activity in the sequence uh, at runtime. So we do that with, uh, with subscription data. So by default, every activity in this runbook is going to publish data to a shared data bus. It all runs within a Windows process. 
what I do here, I, I put some free text in there. You see I put an alert, uh, alert colon on the front, so when I was looking in the ticketing system, I'd have a real good idea where this came from. And then I simply right click and from the subscribe menu, I pick publish data. So what I want on the, uh, the subject line of my email, which is going to become the title of my alert, was I just wanted the name of the alert. So you see from publish data, it's showing me all the output of monitor alert. I didn't do anything to put that there. It's a default behavior of orchestrator. So I scroll down to the end and I grab name, pick it, hit OK, and there it is. It looks kind of like a hyperlink, right? I hit the add button and I added the address of my service desk's SMTP listener. So I'm going to send that ticket over to the mailbox that it's watching or its listening agent. And the, d the message body is simply the alert description, the details of what uh, I want to put into that alert. So using that same published data feature, uh, I can go back to monitor alert and I can grab the description, which is right there. Um, you know, incidentally, there are so many properties, I can you know, mix free text and subscription data to put additional information here. Like if I wanted to put the computer name, for example, I can put that in there and that alert actually has a NetBIOS computer name associated with it. So I can subscribe and format until I'm happy with what it looks like. At the end of the day, I'm sending a simple HTML message. Um, I can look at the connect option here. You see I put a mail server in there, I put an address, and you might say, you know, I could do that with, with PowerShell, so what? Uh, you know, a couple of the advantages of Orchestrator as a platform is, you know, number one, it reduces our reliance on code. You know, I find that Orchestrator does about 85% of what I want out of the box. The other 10 or 15%, PowerShell's my go-to guy. That's going to be how I bridge gaps quickly and easily. So I use PowerShell, I use a lot less PowerShell, so my peers can more easily support the work I'm doing. Now, technically speaking, that's all I would need to do. I can check that runbook in, start it up, it's going to monitor for those alerts, and it's going to send emails. But here's where I wanted to start getting a little bit smarter with Orchestrator and getting into the realm of what would take some effort if I was writing a script, right? So at the end of the day, one of the things I wanted to watch for is to make sure that I didn't raise the same alert twice. So I drug another activity out here from the Operations Manager Integration Pack called Update Alert. The Update Alert activity actually lets me go back into Operations Manager from Orchestrator and write to any property of that alert that is actually writable. So in this case, I use that same fancy subscription feature there to grab, to uh, subscribe to the published data, and I'm actually going back to the first activity in my runbook, and I'm grabbing the ID of the alert that I would like to update. Because that's how I'm going to go find the right alert. And what I'm going to do is every alert, uh, I know just from using Ops Manager a couple of times, uh, has 10 custom fields there. So I decided what I'm going to do is use custom field 10, and I'm just going to stamp Scorch was here, or something like that. So I know that Orchestrator updated this. So I, I, you see here I put incident logged by Orchestrator. So now, how do I tell this runbook uh, I don't want you to process any alert where that field is not empty? So even if you're an experienced Orchestrator, this might be something that's new to you. So what we're doing here with this monitor alert, it's gonna, you know, only going to trigger on new alerts, but you might accidentally go in here and check update alert. So as a bit of insurance, so to speak, what I did was on my link that connects these two activities, I added a bit of smart filtering logic. So on that link that connects the monitor alert to the email, I uh, configured custom field 10 so we could watch for custom, where custom field 10 matches the pattern. And you see that caret and that dollar sign? That's a regular expression that says beginning a string, end a string. That evaluates to null. So what I've done here effectively is said I only want you to move from monitor alert to sending the email if custom field 10 is empty because I know I haven't touched it already. Um, with Orchestrator, so I'm not going to log uh, a duplicate activity there. So the guys and I put this together, it took about 15 minutes, and then my biggest problem was just putting the brakes on them uh, because this technically wasn't even in scope. I got them a little too excited and, you know, the wheels are turning and they're ready to automate the world. Uh, so I had another request in the back of the room, strangely, right before I came up here, and I intended to show this to you anyway. 
uh, because it's the number one request I've had in the last six months in the orchestrator trainings that I've delivered around the country. And somebody in the back of the room said, you know, somebody called me and said they want to monitor a mailbox for incoming messages and take, you know, some sort of action. Uh, conveniently, that's something that's very easy to do with Orchestrator. Uh, and this particular runbook is made possible by virtue of the fact that Orchestrator has a huge user community out there uh, with talented people that are not only building and sharing runbooks, but even building and sharing integration packs, those activities that you see over on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, and I'm sure Microsoft will back me up here. They give you their blessing to go out and use those with some proper testing, of course, and work those into your everyday um, automation sequences. So I grabbed off a CodePlex and Exchange Mail integration pack written by our pal Ryan uh, up, up in the northern U.S., kind of a minor celebrity in the orchestrator world, real talented guy. But he built what you'll see here, uh, an activity called Monitor Mailbox. So this is a pretty intelligent activity. It has a global configuration option where I can define Global configurations are up on my options menu there. I can define the mailbox that I would like Orchestrator to watch here. So all I have to do is supply, number one, my messaging platform. So in this case, I'm using Exchange 2010. And I put a login in there, so it's going to find my you know, primary mailbox automatically. And that last line there where you see the funky URL, that's the Exchange 2010 web service. So this is a pretty intelligent a uh, piece of automation Ryan's written here. So we're going to be watching that inbox for messages. So in my monitor mailbox activity, I have to go pick the global configuration. And th in this case, I only have one. I pick that admin mailbox. You could have two or three or five or 50 if you wanted to, if you had enough systems out there that needed to monitor a mailbox for some reason. I really don't care why, uh, but the, the capabilities there. So I actually just left the defaults here. Uh, which uh, is going to monitor the inbox. So yes, that implies that you could monitor a folder other than the inbox if you so choose. It's going to check every 60 seconds. I'm telling it that my default message format is HTML because that's what OWA is in my environment. And um, it's going to process all the mail. Now down here in the filter tab, uh, I went a little bit further and said I want you to filter for emails that say run to the hills. So I'm assuming there's some sort of data center event and we better get the heck out of here. So now I'm filtering my footprint down here to very specific messages. And I could do anything I want with this within the confines of my capabilities in Orchestrator. So I decided I would log a message to the event log. Orchestrator, if you use this uh, send event log message, it's going to log an event to the application log. I kind of use this as a testing mechanism when I write my runbooks to just see what the output is of my activities to make sure I'm actually getting the data I think I'm getting. It's kind of a, uh, a clever and useful little um, mechanism. And in this case, all I'm doing is moving the mail from the inbox over to a folder called Odyssey. Now, since we're a little short on time, I got a lot, of, lot to show you in only an hour to do it. I actually ran this ahead of time so you can see what the output of this runbook is. I don't want to send, spend 10 minutes sending messages when we can do it. So what it does is I've got a folder there named Odyssey, and it basically just takes the messages and moves it. Now, somebody in the back of the room said, well, could I take that message and now trigger an alert in Operations Manager? If you're out there and you're the one that said that, tell me if I got that right. So I'm going to stop this run book, and I'm going to check it out. Check me out. Uh, we're going to check this run book out, and in the... Operations Manager Integration Pack, I have um, an activity called Create Alert. So playing that game, I can do this in X activities. Two activities, baby, right there. I can go straight from Monitor Mailbox to Create Alert to Done Deal in two activities. No scripting required. Uh, you know, orchestrator, if you weren't here last year, is something you can learn in a month of Friday. So that's just a couple of pretty powerful automation sequences uh, that you could engage in just as starting points before you even know where the heck you're going. You know, before you go back to your organization and you try to really uh, lay some heavy knowledge on them, it's good to get your hands on Orchestrator, do some simple automation, take those initial steps in the, uh, the journey. 
let's flip back to the slides, please. Um, and, uh, and, and just get your wits about you before you begin offering that sort of advice. Again, with, with the virtual academy, with uh, TechNet Virtual Labs, there'll be a refresh here pretty quick. You're going to find that you can learn Orchestrator pretty well in a month of Friday afternoon. That's not something I would say to you about OpsMan, about ConfigMan, about Service Manager. I'd tell you to pack a lunch before you try to master one of those. Orchestrator, conveniently, is one of these things that connects all of these enterprise components, but it's so easy to learn. Um, so let's have that discussion. You know, what is the optimal starting point for my organization with Orchestrator? Um, you know, it, it's really going to depend on the priorities within your organization. So it's a good idea to get a read on what are the current issues that are affecting your organizations? What are, what, are the, what are the priorities? You know, what are the objectives on your scorecard for the next year? What are the objectives on your boss's scorecard for the next 12 months? You know, get, get some targets out there. Uh, look around you. What are your internal support skills? You know, do you have some good PowerShell guys? Do you have, you know, a gal over in the corner that writes a lot of C Sharp? Get a read on what your, you know, what the high end of your automation capabilities are so you know uh, you know, what you're going to be able to achieve as you, uh, you know, move forward. And perhaps most importantly, talk to your service desk folks. Talk to your change manager. Look at how, you know, incident management, change management, you know, maybe release management, depending on if you're feeling froggy, um, you know, how that works in your environment and determine how you can, you know, connect your runbooks over to those processes to close the loop. At the end of the day, this is going to be a heck of a lot less useful if we're out there, uh, you know, instrumenting vast, uh, you know, automation sequences and we're logging nothing. You know, that's one of the advantages of orchestrator over scripting is it has native logging capabilities that are very powerful. I can send an email with one activity. I can reach out to a lot of enterprise service desks uh, with relative ease. And so you want to make sure you're thinking about doing that uh, early in the game. So what I like to do is get everybody in a room and just look at the list of candidates for automation. And before we get into the room and we have that meeting, I send them an email. And I say, I want you to answer these questions for me and come to the meeting with a list of your top five to ten, okay? Um, do some thinking, guys. Tell me what, you know, your personal short-term objectives are. What processes do you have that are just time-consuming and repetitive and just make you mad? Uh, you know, where in your service delivery process do you have sore spots where things aren't going right, things are failing frequently, uh, you know, maybe visible to higher ups in the organization. Nobody likes, you know, their, their street cred suffering over a problem that they don't feel like they can, uh, can handle. And maybe even think about this not so much in technical terms but financial terms, you know. What, what's going on out there that's costing us money today as an organization? What can I bring to the table that might add some value. And so what we do is take all of these questions and we run it through what I like to call uh, the RBA, the Runbook Automation Reality Filter. Uh, and I've seen a lot of these lists, several dozen in the last couple of years where everybody gets in the room and I look at the list of candidates for automation and I guess ahead of time I know, you know, which two or three are going to surface to the top and I'm surprised at how many times I get that wrong. Uh, because at the end of the day, your candidates for runbook automation are going to come down to two or three or four criteria. What do you have out there uh, that is a, a recurring process that happens frequently? You know, if I'm going to spend time automating something, I'm going to put priority on something that comes up three times a day or five times a week versus something that happens once a quarter. Um, you know, how much variance in there, is there in the process? You know, is the input that I need to automate this process something that I can predict? Uh, if it's not you know, entirely predictable, do I have a good data source where I can go to get the answer to that information? You know, variance is not a deal killer, but it makes automation a little bit more challenging. So variance is the second thing I like to look at. Uh, and I like to think about complexity. You know, what is going to be required to do this? What are the interfaces on the disparate system, systems that I'm bringing together? Do I have native activities in Orchestrator? Can I use the run.net script activity in Orchestrator to run a little bit of PowerShell, or am I going to have to get serious? Um, figure that out ahead of time. And then, you know, for those things that float to the top as high frequency, low variance, high effort, um, you know, maybe add 
expensive on there? You know, how much money are we losing every time we have to, to execute that activity? Or how much are we losing every time process XYZ breaks over there in the corner? From that, you can get a pretty good idea of your direction. And remember at the end of the day, runbook automation is designed to be easier to support than scripting. We're gonna build lots of little runbooks, modular runbooks, reusable runbooks. Uh, there's an activity that my team orchestrated at a cust at customer request on Friday night in 90 minutes. And a year ago, if you'd asked me how long that would have taken, I would have told you two weeks, give or take. But we've made these tiny investments, building little runbooks with, generally speaking, less than 10 or 15 activities. I think I can count on one hand the runbooks we have over 30 activities. Um, bear that in mind. Modular, reusable, function-specific runbooks. Uh, runbooks to go look things up in Active Directory, to go find an object class, a distinguished name, uh, to log an event if something fails. Uh, I've stumbled into some organizations that are doing great things with orchestration, and I've stumbled into a couple of fantastic failures. Uh, I, I spent some time with, with an org that was working on their private cloud, and they had developed uh, runbook automation with Opalis. It could have just as easily been orchestrator because the, the components are so very, very similar. Um, the same for all practical purposes in this discussion. Uh, they were deploying what amounted to a service in system center terms. They called it something else. But they were automating deployment of two web servers, a SQL database server. They were deploying lots of software to those servers. They were configuring the, the web servers to talk to the database, et cetera, et cetera. And I looked at this on the surface, you know, because they were driving it from a custom portal. I said, man, that's pretty cool. I'd love to meet your orchestrator and have him show me what he's done. And so they brought, you know, the man of the hour in the room, and he opens up a run book that's more than 150 activities, 15 branches of logic. Um, and I'm just floored because he's taken, you know, 75% of the benefits of runbook automation and just thrown them out the window. He's built, built something that's as difficult to support as any script out there. Uh, in fact, he was the only guy in the organization that really knew what was going on there. And, and if I mentioned the name of this company, you'd recognize him. Um, operationally, he had created a risk. He was deploying software by running command line commands after copying binaries off of a file share. So literally copying SQL Server down to the server doing the install. And I said, you know, you guys have Config Manager installed, don't you? Well, yeah, but I'm not the Config Manager guy. But he's on your team, right? Yeah. So that's, you know, just the perfect example of that guy that took the ball and ran with it, except he kicked it in the other team's goal. Uh, so they are in just, you know, it's a fantastic disaster from uh, a supportability perspective. So uh, if you go out to, to Bing and just search on ROI for RBA, you'll hit a blog post I did that uh, we kind of encapsulates some of what I've shared with you here and has some links out to other resources. So uh, uh, some good things to think about. But now that we're getting in the right direction, how many of you out there have written a run book that... Uh, you trigger from service manager. So you're using service manager self-service portal to drive something. Is it really only two or three guys? Okay. Well, anyway, when you get to the point that you're ready to do this, and you're going to be ready to do this in the next 12 months, I'm sure of it when we're done here, I want to talk to you about how you can minimize the need to, to do rework in your self-service provisioning workflows uh, even as you grow. Because, uh, you know, as you saw with those initial orchestrations we did, we were looking at two or three activities, but it was pretty powerful. And you're going to make incremental improvements. You're going to come back next month and maybe add to that service desk integration maybe some communication back to operations manager to fill in the ticket ID field on the alert. So maybe you, you kind of advance to two-way communication in the future, and you'll want to make these modular investments. So I'm going to talk to you about moving from plain text processing. You know, we, you, can, you can get your, your service manager self-service portal input, and you can parse it as text. Um, but we're going to put on our big boy pants, and we're going to look at, at XML. I'm going to show you um, how every one of your self-service uh, service manager integrated run book should look. They should all have exactly one input that's required by service manager. And incidentally, service manager only cares 
about what is, what is the input this runbook requires in its first activity. Service manager doesn't, do what, doesn't care what you do in activities 2 to 30. It doesn't care that your mother didn't hold you enough as a child. It just wants to know what is the input I need to, to pass in here. Flip over to uh, the demo for me if you would. But basically, most of my, my run books have one input. They, have the run, they require the run book activity ID. So I'm just going to jump into the portal here. And I'm not going to take you through building this run book because that would take an hour. Um, all by itself. But I'm just going to show you the front end what the self-service request looks like. Uh, it's actually a self-service um, security group uh, request. So a user can, let me just pop back in there. Uh, the user can request access to one or more Active Directory security groups. There we go. And uh, I even like to put approval in there. Even if, even if a particular self-service request doesn't require approval, I like to put an approval activity into my service request, and I'll mark the approval algorithm as automatic, because someday it might not be automatic, and that means I can just go back in and I can drop whoever needs to approve this thing into the, uh, the run book. Uh, so just looking at my self-service portal here, my... Uh, service request is requesting ac access to an Active Directory group. So you see I'm asking for a cost center here. Uh, I have a multi-select interface below here. Incidentally, I'm populating this list from my service manager CMDB, courtesy of the Active Directory connector. Um, and I don't care if you have HP or CA or insert your competitor, your competitive CMDB in here. You can use Orchestrator as a rich repository for driving your runbook automation. It's not a zero-sum game here. We're not asking to take over change in incident management. We're talking about kicking the training wheels off and empowering ourselves to do some very advanced automation because the orchestration web console, as nice as it is, has very limited capability for us to offer any guidance to our end user. There's no data validation where I can, you know, prompt them back and say, hey, man, you put your email address in wrong. But Service Manager does have that capability. Uh, it has the capability to compare numeric ranges, to, to, to validate email addresses, to get into regular expression if that's where I want to go. Uh, so I ask my user for just a couple of things here. Give me your your, um, sorry, I have a little connectivity issue here. Give me your cost center, give me your department, and give me your justification. That's all I want to know. And then I'm going to kick this critter off. So I put that in, I hit the go button, and at that point, my request is often, often submitted. Now, if I go over to service manager, here's what I'm getting to. So I, I went a long way around to get to the point, and we're here. So. Here's a completed version of one of those service requests where this uh, access request went through, service manager triggered a run book and added this user with approval to multiple Active Directory groups. Uh, you will see down here, if I scroll down, I'm looking at service request SR447. And I'll, if I scroll down far enough, you're going to see the user input here. And you're going to see that it has fancy tags here because it's XML. So if my form has three, interface, three questions to the user or 30, they're all going to be here. And if I can consume the user input out of this runbook activity, I have everything I need to parse that input. And if we come back six months from now and we want to rework this runbook to do something completely different, much fancier, et cetera, I don't have to change a thing in Service Manager because all Service Manager needs to give me is the runbook activity ID. Now let me show you what we do with that. I'm going to open this service request up. We're going to go have a look at that runbook activity. And I'm going to show you the three activities you need to put at the, at the beginning of every one of your service manager runbooks. Um, and if you don't do this for six months, remember this session. Come back and watch this. Write this down. I need these three activities at the beginning of every service manager integrated runbook. So here it is. So there's my approval activity. I told you I like to put an approval activity there even if I set it to automatic. So I'm going to just double click on this runbook activity. And what I'm going to be looking for here is the runbook activity ID, which is, is a GUID, actually. So I will um, go into this runbook activity. I'll go over to the runbook. Um, <coughs> you'll see 
the, um, the run book ID is exposed here. If I scroll down under the parameter values, I can actually cut and paste the, uh, the GUID right out of here, and that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to control C that and do a little copy. And I'm going to go up here and show you my processing user input strategy. So it requires three activities. The first of those is the initialized data activity. If you change the number of inputs in your initialized data activity after you've connected a run book to Service Manager, it's going to break it. And you're going to have to go back into Service Manager and do all that work again. So the reason we're only asking for this one component for all of history is it's going to ensure I never have to go back into Service Manager and do that work. It's not complicated after you've done it a couple of times, but it's not intuitive. And nobody likes to do something over again just because, do they? Uh, so I'm going to ask for that run book uh, activity ID. My next activity comes out of the Service Manager integration pack. It's called Get Relationship. And what I'm going to do with Get Relationship here is I'm going to process the run book activity ID that Service Manager passes when it triggers this run book using, you got it, published data. So I'm just grabbing that run book activity bit there. And what I'm doing is looking up the run book automation activity and finding its related service request. Because you remember when I looked at the service request, I could see the user input, right? I could see the XML I need to parse to get something done. Um, and so my next activity is the, uh, the get object activity. And I've told it to go get the service request. Uh, that is the related class, the related instance, uh, related object, if you will, to that um, run book automation activity. So you see I've set uh, get ob I've, I've renamed get object to get sr, and I set my class to service request, which you pick from an object picker that will show you every class you have in, in Service Manager. And, I, and I've set to where the GUID equals the related object ID from the get relationship activity. So I gave it the GUID of my runbook automation activity, and it went and found the GUID of the service request. So now. I am home free. I am ready to make it rain. So when I go into my send event log message, I basically put this here just for illustration purposes to show you what we're going to consume. What I care about from all these service manager integrated runbooks is this right here. I want to see this user input from get service request. It's going to send me over that XML. And now you can parse that using the XPath query activities in Orchestrator. I can execute XPath queries. Raise your hand if you're not all that familiar with X XPath queries. Be honest. Yeah, that was me too 18 months ago. So I went out and did a search, and I went to w3schools.org and found a tutorial that in about 10 minutes showed me how to write XPath queries of varying levels of complexity. I'm an IT pro like most of you. Not rocket science, w3schools.org. Fantastic resource for HTML and all of those ridiculous little oddities of, uh, of automation. So let's just test this. I actually built this just to show you these first three activities, just to give you a feel for what the user input looks like when we send it over. So I've launched the runbook tester here, which is a great way for me to just execute this activity. And you see there, it's asking me for the input, the same input it would ask of Service Manager. Give me your runbook activity ID. Now, you remember I did a control C in theory, and only in theory, it would seem. So I'm going to go back here and do a copy, a proper copy. And I'm going to do a proper paste. There we go. So if I run this, if I didn't make any mistakes in copying that, if I didn't get any extra characters, it's going to go find that runbook activity and then find the related service request retrieve the user input, and log an event. Holla. OK, so there we go, done. So let me just use the show details here. What I love about this runbook tester is I can drill down into the output of these activities. So I'm going to get down to my log entry description. And there you can see the little XML of the user inputs. And what it passes in there, let's just grab that real quick. What it brings in in this XML document are the questions uh, that we ask the user over here in the interface. So all of these questions we were asking in that Active Directory um, runbook activity, like give me your, your cost center and all that, uh, in, this doc, in this XML document that I've captured, the user input, it's going to say, 
um, you know, qu question, please enter your cost center, and then it's going to have answer 1,000 in quotes. So I'm going to have the entire conversation that happened between that user and service manager with, uh, with very little effort uh, on my part. But, but the important thing here is, is now I never have to change the first activity. I never have to go back and start from scratch rebuilding um, any of my um, service manager integration. It's going to be able to stand even as I add new fields to my service request, even as I uh, rework my runbook with all sorts of new and varied and, and wonderful logic, right? So basically in here, um, well, you can see it here. You can basically see user inputs and questions and answers. I'm not going to waste too much more time on it, but uh, you see the answer and you'll see the question. Like there it says enter justification question. So if you can parse XPath queries, which you will be able to in uh, 15 minutes or less after w3schools.org, you're going to be good to go. Put that in your back pocket. Uh, let's go back to the slide, please. Um, so that's, uh, you know, the first step. And I know you might say, you know, we don't have service manager where I work and we can't do this, um, you know, because we have a CMDB. Fact of the matter is I don't care. Again, we're going to get to that in a minute. So let's talk about um, integrating communication into your workflow. So, you know, my first, um, you know, instinct as an IT guy is, of course, I'm going to notify somebody when the, when the uh, automation is done, right? So if I provision a virtual machine, I'm going to send an email to the user that says, hey, man, it's ready. Log in here. Um, the fact of the matter is uh, you really need to vet your automation with the audience that's going to be consuming it, right? namely the end user oftentimes, that quasi-technical person that maybe only understands a tiny fraction of the technology. And so what's obvious to you is, you know, their own private nightmare as they flounder about trying to figure out what um, they are supposed to do uh, to make their request. So timing and format of your communication are actually very, very important. So if your orchestration, you know, if your, your automation sequence leaves people with questions, um, results in phone calls to your help desk that, you know, depending on the study you look at, cost at least 25 bucks a pop. Uh, results in confusion at some level that has people calling you the expensive tier three resources. You need to rethink your approach uh, because you're not saving your company money, you're, you're, you're costing money at that point. So we just need to refine it a bit. And I, I'm not saying this from uh, a place of superiority. I'm saying this is a play from the place of the guy who's made the mistake. Uh, let's go back to the, the demo screen, if we could, please. So, uh, you know, the target for me when I'm sitting down with a customer is, generally speaking, we march a user in the room, we put them at the console, and say, provision a virtual machine. Here's your, here's your keyboard. Go. And that's all we tell them. And we see if they can get there. And the fact of the matter is, if they can't get there uh, without asking a bunch of questions, uh, then, you know, I need to go back and kind of figure out how I can bridge that gap. And so... Looking at the self-service portal with Service Manager, one of the things I love about this is I can create categories with simple lists. And you see I've divided them into categories like access and security, data center and cloud services. I'm trying to create little buckets that will help my users navigate to where I want them to get. Right below the category is the service offering. So you see there, access services. So in some environments, uh, I, I actually wind up with a one-to-one -one mapping of that service offering to the request offering because that service offering needs to say request access to an Active Directory group. And then they get down here to the actual request offering and it says the very same thing. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to take a novice, you know, a, a technology, uh, you know, limited user and make this intuitive and easy for them to consume. At the end of the day, you know, I, I know I've won if I can put that user on the console and they can get to the end of this experience without uh, having to call me to say, hey man, where's my virtual machine? Um, so I'm going to show you a run book that I created. This was one of my very first automations back in the Opalis, or you know, it was orchestrator with service manager in beta something, okay? It was right after they enabled this feature. Here was my run book. Very simple. Initialize data. Grab my data. And in this case, this was, this was before I was even, you know, executing my own 
uh, one parameter only run book. This one had a little more. I was asking for the user's email address and the name of the virtual machine they wanted to create. Uh, this was before I had you know, kind of made the connection that run book ID was the way I was going to go. So uh, basically, give me your email address and your, your virtual machine name, and I figure they can't screw it up. Um, and then I used an activity out of the virtual machine manager integration pack. It's called create VM from template. So I supplied all the values here, the server we were going to deploy it to, uh, everything I needed except that virtual machine name, which I'm consuming from the user at runtime using that published data uh, from the, uh, the subscribe to publish data menu. So I was just going and grabbing the VM name. And as you can already guess, uh, you notice how I've color coded my branches here. If it succeeds, that's green. If it fails, that's red. I've even changed the label on that link just by double clicking it. Uh, I like to create a lot of visual navigation, so the people that come behind me can visually look at my runbook and roughly figure out what the heck I'm doing. If I've color-coded and labeled things to a certain degree, it's not going to be rocket science for them to figure out what I'm doing. So my branches do exactly this. They look at the result of create VM from template, and if it fails, uh, that link allows it to go down the failure branch and to send a message out to the administrator to say, hey, this failed, go check it out. On the other hand, if it succeeds, it goes down the other branch with the VM from template returning success and sends a success message out to the end user with a nice little uh, dynamic message, an RDP to this address, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, this actually failed in our first round of tests. And the reason it failed was they hit the button uh, on the nice service manager request form. The virtual machine provisioning was, in fact, in progress, but I didn't communicate back to the user. So they're sitting there. Um, like the monkey at the monolith, you know, monkeys at the monolith at the beginning of 2001. Remember, they're kind of kind of staring up there, looking at this thing. In Oklahoma, we call it uh, like a cow staring at a new gate. They know it wasn't there yesterday. They're not quite sure. You know, it's pretty cool, but they're not quite sure what it does. So they just kind of stand there looking at it. Um, and that's what these users were doing. They're standing there looking at their portal, and they're calling, saying, "All right, it didn't work." And we're like, "Well, yeah, it's working." I'm like, no, it's not. I don't have my virtual machine. I don't know what's going on. So the fix was really quite simple. It was a matter of communication, just thinking. You know, have you ever had a girl break up with you and she says, it wasn't me, it's, it's, you know, it wasn't you, it's me? You know, these end users call up and they're typically apologizing in the same way. You know, maybe it's just me. Well, no, they don't mean that. And your girlfriend didn't mean that either. It's you, right? <laughs> so, so, so we have to take it for what it is. And I remember being pretty frustrated, but at the end of the day, um, what we did was, uh, was actually check this run book out. And I took that send email activity and I dropped it right here between uh, initialize data and create VM from template. So if we actually got the input from service manager, we triggered an email that said, hey user, your virtual machine request is in progress. We're going to get back to you within 24 hours to say this is done. Mission accomplished. That's all it took was one simple change uh, on my part. So, so again, you know, when we're talking about effective automation, you have to think about your audience and you want to meet them where they live. So it's not, you know, your responsibility to teach them all about virtualization. It's your responsibility to make them not care uh, that they don't know a lot about virtualization. At the end of the day, that's what the self-service portal is all about. It's, it's to implement our service model in an interface that anybody who can run, you know, anybody who can log a help desk, you know, ticket can navigate, right? Um, easy cheesy. Let's flip back over if we could, please. So, the secret. All right, so I work in large enterprise. Cameron and I do some, some stuff together, and at the end of the day, uh, there are a lot of companies out there that have some other CMDB. The fact of the matter is I couldn't care any less than I do right now. And a lot of organizations make the assumption we have another CMDB, so we can't adopt Service Manager. So how did the licensing change? It changed now to where when you, you own one component, you own them all, right? Because it's a single product. So you probably own Service Manager in some way, shape, or form. And the fact of the matter is, if you can give your users a, an intuitive self-service interface today, um, it could be the difference between the picture on the left and the picture on the right. And two years from now, after you've been leveraging 
service manager, CMDB, and all those connectors that populate information from Active Directory and from all your provisioning activities and all your access requests, you have a rich repository of data. And you can be selfish and you can keep it to yourself. And two or three or four years from now, when your organization comes back and it's time to re-up those, those uh, service desk licenses for HP or CA or whatever, hey, I've got a surprise for you guys. Come check this out. Remember that self-service portal you let me put in place? Look at all the data I have for you right here. I have the last two or three years of everything we've done. I've got all of our assets out of Active Directory, out of Operations Manager, out of Config Manager, out of Virtual Machine Manager. Oh, and by the way, we put the, the Veeam management pack in and using the Ops Manager CI connector, I put all of the VMware information in the CMDB because I, I could and it makes me feel kind of cool, actually. So at the end of the day, um, and, and organizations are warming up to this. So, so I deal with engineers just like you every day that are frustrated by what's going on around them and they want to get, you know, they want to gain a measure of control. So uh, a, a selfish deployment of service manager, and I don't mean a weeks long, you know, massively planned deployment. I mean stand up a couple of VMs, get the CMDB there, get the self-service portal in place and set up the connectors. You know, for the love of Pete, it's going to take you a day, day and a half. Um, you guys probably work in some companies that are big enough that you can probably get the SQL guys to install, install SQL for you, which is the piece that takes the longest, frankly. So get the CMDB in place at minimum. The service catalog comes automatically. We just have to deploy uh, that component, and it's there. Um, you know, you're going to have a rich repository. Orchestrator is pretty cool. It's much more powerful, exponentially more powerful, if I have this CMDB with connectors coming from multiple system center components from Active Directory, from remote SQL databases, with integration packs that I get from Microsoft in all areas of my organization. Uh, and when the time comes, when the organization is ready for a license refresh, when we're ready to look at what our service desk is, is costing us, when we're ready to move into advanced asset management, you saw, uh, a pretty cool asset management solution on stage earlier today that is so inexpensive that it should be against the law. Um, I love you guys. You know who I'm talking about. Um, but let's look at what this unlocks. So one day, if we can flip back to the demo, please. One day, a government, a guy from a government called me and he said exactly this. He said, if you can show me X, um, we will adopt System Center. He said, you just need to show me one thing. And I said, okay, what is that one thing? And he gave me his, his self-service request, and it was somewhere between 50 and 75 lines long. I forget because I just looked at this and said, oh my God, we're never going to be able to navigate this. He said, we need, he said, we, we support hundreds of agencies, and we need to give them access to SQL databases on demand. Um, we need to show them a list of servers, and they need to be able to pick uh, from that server the right SQL instance, and then the database, and then they need to tell us what SQL role they need access to. And oh, by the way, you're not going to get off using the Active Directory groups that you were telling me about earlier. We're going to use SQL authentication. Wow. Um, so at the end of the day, just leveraging the tiny investments that we've made incrementally over in an orchestrator over the last couple of years, in a long weekend, I think we started Friday night, and by late Saturday, we saw the end of the, we saw the light at the end of the tunnel by Sunday lunchtime. Done deal. I've got a request for SQL database access using nothing more than uh, the service manager CMDB and the SQL assets that I pulled across the ops manager CI connector. The SQL assets don't show up in the CMDB by default, but with one line of PowerShell, I can actually tell Service Manager, I want to whitelist the SQL database class. I want to whitelist the SQL database engine class so my SQL instances uh, show up. And I created, with, uh, with the help of my team, we created a cascading form. So it shows us the SQL servers. Now you see those refresh buttons there? That's not a limitation of what I did. That's a limitation of Service Manager because it's a web interface, right? So I pick my SQL server, I hit the refresh button down here below, and it shows me my SQL instances, and then below here, it shows my SQL databases. 
and I can pick my database, and then I pick my SQL role. And, and they were actually happy. They said, just show us all of the roles that are in that database. And they said, we don't you know, deviate from the default. So I just put a, a static list in here because that worked for them. Uh, and then give me the information about the user. Now, I could have captured the user input, but they said, this is really important. The end user is never the person filling out this form. It's somebody in IT. So we need you to support proxy requests. So at the end of the day, just make sure that we put in here domain backslash username, and that'll be good enough. I can live with that. It's, it's, it's more work than grabbing the user token, but not uh, challenging, uh, to say the least. So at the end of the day, I grab all of that information. I go through a couple of screens here, first name, last name. And in this case, they wanted SQL auth. Uh, so I have to supply SQL ID. See that little red box popping up here? That's the, the validation of service manager, making sure I put the right value in the box. Big, big win for you guys if you go down the service manager route. Bigger win if I don't hit the cap lock key. I don't care. Everybody can put in an email address. Pick the SQL ID that you would like for this user. If you're, you know, they had a crazy requirement, they said, we need to be able to choose the SQL ID. Mission accomplished. What's behind this, incidentally, is a run book that uses some native activities, uh, what we call standard activities in Service Manager, and I'm not going to take you through the entire runbook because it's going to cross your eyes. Because what you're going to see in my runbook is a lot of uh, child runbooks being called. I build lots of little um, modular runbooks so I can just pass calls out to other runbooks. Um, if my demo cooperates here, I'll actually show you the call that I'm making here to tell you something I do when I call a child runbook, I actually have a parent runbook parameter. So when I call the child runbook, which is uh, this little invoke runbook activity here, when I call the child runbook, I actually pass the name of the runbook I'm calling it from because in each of my runbooks, I log an error if it fails, and I also log the name of the runbook that triggered it. So I can, through my granular process, easily troubleshoot where my problem came from. And that, guys, is really the top of the mountain with this. You know, you don't, you don't, it's not a zero-sum game here. Microsoft knows that you have, you know, VMware out there in your, your virtualization stack. I deployed a VMware with System Center every week. That, that government example I just gave you deployed entirely to ESX 5.1 with System Center 2012 CTP. Let's go back to the deck, please. So we're down to about a minute and 40. So fortunately, I think we're just right to the end here. So at the end of the day, guys, uh, you know, this is the top of the mountain, and it's so easy for you to achieve. You know, building those service manager integrated runbooks is something you can go learn on TechNet Virtual Labs. Uh, you know, go book a training class. Get some service manager training. Um, but full-blown deployment of System Center is not required. Put some seed deployments out there to populate your repository for major league runbook automation. Kick the training wheels off and make it happen. This can save you, uh, with one organization, we estimated it would save them more than two years uh, in developing these automation capabilities on their own using their existing CMDB. That was their figure, not mine. So, you know, guys, why wouldn't you do that if you could do that? I mean, why? Well, I don't think there is any question about it. It can only be attributable to human error. It can only be attribu attributable to human error. I love that line. I love that line. It's absolutely true, guys. So, so give it some thought. Um, you know, I hope that in the last hour you've picked up a couple of tips. And if you're going to install Orchestrator and start running down the road, you now feel like you got a good idea for how you can run in the right direction. Pete Zerger signing off from the center. Pete, job well done. Um, so I think we're going to get set up at this point in time to go through uh, Q&A. So we will be doing the drawing for the MMS uh, pass right at the end of Q&A, which I think is scheduled for a maximum of 30 minutes. That's what we're looking at. So uh, have we got anything between now and then, or are they going to come up and set up up here? What's up, Amelia?
Let's go ahead and get set up for Q&A. All right. Um, so a couple of stats, for uh, shout outs for our folks online and the rest of it um, while, we're, while we're getting that done. Um, so we have had over 550 people connecting just on mobile devices today um, across the board in the different locations that we're at. We've synchronized up with 25 plus user groups. We've had a lot of good Q&A questions that have come through. Um, so we hopefully got some really good stuff to be able to go through. Um, I'll be hopefully coordinating that. Uh, so we'll, I'll get off the stage so they can do that. We just sold out all the floor seats. Take me on a trip, I'd like to go someday. Take me to New York, I'd love to see LA. I really want to come pick you with you. You'll be my American boy. He said, hey sister, it's really, really nice to meet ya. I just met this five foot seven guy who's just my type. Like the way he's speaking. Confidence is peaking. Don't like his baggy jeans, but I'm a like
<laughs> we have no microphones yet, so that's one thing we'll need is any handheld mics that we're going to bring up here. If we have any handheld mics, we'll see what's going on with that here. So, um, yeah, we need one of those before we can do introductions. So just one second. All right, so when we wrap this up tonight um, at 6 o'clock, we'll, uh, we'll be calling uh, the winner for the MMS. Uh, so the MMS uh, badge or attendance this year, as well as announcing uh, SCU 2014 location. So if I'm going to go ahead and hand this, and if you guys would, introduce yourselves, who you're with, and uh, pass it on down the line. Sean Erickson with Saracen. I love long walks on the beach. Yes, he does. <laughs> Paul Sasson from Saracen. I'm going over um, here. Do you really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Wally Mead, Microsoft. Travis Wright, Microsoft. Pete Zerger, System Center Central. Maarten goed, I'll answer all the Dutch questions. <laughs> Jason Sandys, Catapult Systems, no Dutch for me. Chris Ross, Catapult Systems. Joey Snow from Microsoft, who eats barbecue until I bleed. There you go. And uh, Cameron Fuller, uh, so I don't have to answer any questions. That's the benefit of actually being in my position right now. I get to determine who's the right person to answer the questions that we get thrown at us. So Amelia's got the list. So she's going to go ahead and choose. Her and Rod are going to start picking some of the, the questions out of this mix that we've got. All right. So our first question is from Ted Hacker. Um, is there any, really any added value of running SCOM, et cetera, on server 2012? It seems like doing it on SQL 2012 is more important. Okay. So hold on. It's, it's focusing on server 2012 or SQL 2012? Server. Server 2012. All right. If there's so, an added value. <laughs> all right. So let me ask, who wants that one? That's any added value. All right. All right. Yeah, so, so is it important? I think the answer is it depends. I mean, obviously, you're going to have a longer uh, you know, support horizon if you go the 2012 route. Uh, but nowadays, everybody is virtualizing SQL with pretty good reason. And you know, when we look at uh, 2012 as a server operating system, uh, you know, Hyper-V on that platform really opens up our options to scale up within a virtual machine, particularly when we're virtualizing SQL. You know, one of the first rules of virtualizing SQL is you can't uh, virtualize a workload that's bigger than the number of uh, virtual CPUs you've got there. So if you're throttled at you know, four vCPUs, it's going to be rough. Uh, you know, and SQL 2012 on top of Server 2012 is going to give you best performance for big workloads and opens up those HA options. So for my money, if you're deploying System Center right now, I don't see a heck of a lot of reason to be talking anything other than Server 2012, even if this is how you're making the introduction uh, of that platform into your organization. Yeah. Does anybody want to add to that? Detractors? Um, actually, I'll Sand add to it first. Sandy's wants to talk about the Metro UI. Oh yeah, well we're gonna, we're gonna shut up Sandy's on, the, on that one, so. <laughs> I'll, I'll add one other piece to that though, also consistency. I mean, when you look at it, if you're gonna deploy System Center as all the components and the rest of it, VMM only runs on Server 2012 with Service Pack 1, so if you really want consistent platform, at least from a server perspective, you really need Server 2012. Yeah, good point. Amen. So, anybody else? All right. I would just add on one more thing there, which is there's, there's really no benefit to running Ops Manager itself on Windows Server, but you get all the benefits of having Windows Server 2012, all the new features that are in there. So, I think that in itself is probably the value that you're looking at. Cool. All right. I think you're up again, Amelia. What's our next one on the list? All right. Our next question is from Burnaby. Covarubias, uh, can a Windows to go on a stick be updated differentially, or does the instance have to be redeployed as the image is updated? Okay. Windows to go question. I won't even try to repeat that, but I think Emily or Amelia's got those spoken well, so who wants to grab that? You need a Windows person here to answer that. Uh, well. Yeah. <laughs> right here. Well. <laughs> yeah, so I kind of do Windows now. Uh, so with Windows to go, it's an operating system just like anything else, if you've got Windows, if, if, if you've got you know, WSUS in your environment and that stick is part of your WSUS policies, it, it can be updated just like any other operating system. Just because it's on a USB stick, it's still a Windows device and you treat it just the same as a Windows device. Now if you're talking about complete rebuilding, you know, again, I, I don't know what the value is in terms of doing it differentially because it is a rather fast installation to begin with. So, I mean, applying a WIM file to a USB stick, is, it, it, it doesn't take all that long, but you treat it just like any other desktop you treat in your environment. 
right. You cool with that, Jason? Because I saw some. All right, so that's an agreement there. Well, no. Alan, hand him the hand him the mic. You got to have the mic. Yeah, but we don't use WSUS to update, right? We use Config Manager. Sure. Whatever your your solution of choice. Offline servicing. Yes. Yes. Patch, patching of choice. All right. Excellent. All right. Our third one. What do we got, Amelia? All right. Um, this one is for Cyrusen. Uh -huh. um, oh, give me one second. Okay. Is it about walks on the beach? I hope not. Unfortunately, it isn't. It's okay. A good. Much less exciting question. I think. Mean. Um, are these asset data from Configuration Manager CMDB? From your presentation in the beginning. From the presentation you saw, it was a demo kit, so like everything else, you have a bunch of demo data to be able to show the best possible scenarios and give the best part of the solution. Generally speaking, we don't care where the data comes from. We federate from all the default connectors being AD, SCCM, SCOM. We take all that data in and we, in the background, have a workflow synchronization process that's using the native workflow inside of the solution to then bring that data, aggregate it into our asset repository. Um, to complement that, you know, it's not our only source of truth. We have the ability to federate any external piece of data. We talked about that a little in the presentation. I think it's a key part of asset management, being able to bring in finance data, organizational data. Generally, it lives in spreadsheets that could live in fixed asset systems, but the net net is it doesn't matter where it comes from. We can bring it in and have a full asset repository around that. Right. Well said. Wear open toe channels on the boot beach. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Amelia. All right. This next question is from Dieter Wickmans. Um, when will it be possible to exclude alerts out of notification creation in SCOM? It would be a nice feature. Ooh, so the question is, when is it possible to be able to exclude alerts from a notification subscription? So I can answer what are the workarounds, but really the answer in terms of when that's a, as available as a feature would probably go right there. I would expect Mr. Travis. That is not a feature on the priority list. Not currently a priority. Wow. So, frankly. Frankly. All right. Well, let me, let me throw out the workaround, at least what our team works with as it stands right now, is we tend to use, if you go with dynamic groups, um, and you actually, you can, within a dynamic group, you can actually exclude um, specific entities from a dynamic group. And this will be the third shout out for uh, Mr. Brian Pavnik today. Um, so he was the one who pointed out this idea, if you do it with a dynamic group, exclude the particular ones that you want to exclude and then build your subscriptions off of that. You can work around the fact that you can't exclude out of a subscription directly. So, good question. Ready for the next one? Jake it. Another All way right. you could do it, sorry, just oh, please, go jump ahead. in here is, um, do your notifications out of service manager or out of orchestrator? Because then you have more control over what gets notified. Well said. So he says no, and then suddenly and he's really helpful. Yeah, hold on. So no, not I, on the, the roadmap. The question but, was about the feature. We're not doing the feature, but I'm, I'm a helpful guy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and All that's right, the what reason we, why we're not doing the feature is because there's better ways of doing it. There's other Already. options. OK, I can accept that. Amelia, what do we oh, got? All right, our next question um, was retweeted a couple times throughout the day. Um, Kid Mystic and Lee Allenberg would like to know what's going to happen with the SESM portal and Silverlight. Is there any redesign in the works? Wow. Have fun with that one. Wow, hold on. So let me, let me start. I'm not even going to answer this, but let me kind of uh, focus this in here and the rest of it. So Silverlight is used in about five of the different portals in the System Center stack as it stands right now. But I will point out from today's presentations that we saw that the Azure portal is no longer running at Silverlight. So just two pieces of information before we even say anything. And with that, I'll kind of lean that direction towards uh, Travis and Wally. <laughs> Oops. Did it get hot in here? Did like, somebody turn off the lights or something? Um, no, so the, uh, we are looking at this, and, uh, you know, people say, oh, Silverlight's dead. You know, why is your portal still in Silverlight? Well, Silverlight's not dead. It's not any more dead than Flash. It's still out there. It still works just fine um, in most scenarios. It doesn't work on other things. But, uh, you know, um, so will we build an HTML5 portal? I don't know. Probably. When? I don't know and so I can't really say anything right now anyways even though I did know mm -hmm. but um, it is something that we are looking at there is a short-term plan that we're looking at can't share what that is right now but it's certainly a pain point that we hear a lot from customers and we're thinking about it that's yeah surface RT uh -huh. that's one of those things that yeah, so exactly. like yeah. run off you know yeah. surface RT that's painful you know well I don't know how painful it is yet just since not that many 
Yeah, yeah, I don't know how many people are using their RT devices to access the self-service portal right now, but yeah, that is a limitation. Yeah. All right, Sergeant. Um, I actually share in the sentiment of the question, but the practicality of it is, is that you look at an organization and interfacing with customers, they're do, generally doing it from their desktops, and that generally means they're running IE, and that generally means they have Silverlight in it. So I, I do get it because it's really cool to run it on this, but I think about my mom when I talk about these things. My mom's not going to access the customer portal from this. She's going to be on her machine, on her laptop. So it's a pain point. I, I agree it's a pain point. I get it asked of me constantly, but um, I don't think it's a business critical thing where it's not going to, it's going to stop the deployment of the customer portal, just to complement that from a practicality perspective. And you're on the intranet. Yeah. And you are on the intranet, yes. Well said. Good answers. All right, Amelia. Okay, this is an Azure question um, from Eric Vandebrink. Is an Azure That's endpoint number. like the Joey FTP servers an IP address from Azure or an IP from one of my office ISP? So when we talk about endpoints, we're talking about opening up specific ports. It's not an IP to IP type of a configuration. So it's essentially like you're opening up any port on a firewall. It's essentially saying, hey, look, I want port 20 or 21 for FTP or 20 and 21 in my case or 1433, whatever it is, you're just opening, punching up those ports so that you can communicate on those ports. That's kind of the whole design of the endpoint. It's not per IP address. Okay. All right. I think that answers it. We got others left in the queue? Oh, we sure do. All right, um, all right. All right, here's another one um, we just saw from Dieter. Is there a reason to keep SCOM and SESM data WH separated now that they are using the same management packs? Warehouse, uh, data warehouse, I assume they're talking about. So is there a reason to separate oh. the SCOM data warehouse and the, which was the other data warehouse, please? Service, Service manager data warehouse, yeah. Um, so yeah, you wanna start, where do you wanna start with that one? Who wants it? I see Chris pointing at other people, which yeah. is probably a good well, indication who goes to Chris first. <laughs> right. Chris, I'm, I'm Chris, more than happy. Chris. So, you know, basically in an ideal world, we would bring, you know, that SCOM data uh, and all the, the monitoring data behind it, you know, into the service manager data warehouse to consume, you know, out of the box. Initially, there's not a queue built, but as Travis showed today, you can easily, well, or somewhat easily build, uh, you know, a queue to consume that data and really start working with it in a unified experience. Uh, so is there a reason to keep it out versus in? You know, I think it depends on your environment, but I'm sure there's a lot of, you know, fodder that we could have on that. Yeah. Well, in fact, that was um, something that I intended to demo here at System Center Universe, but there's just no way I could cover everything plus that in this one hour that I had. So look for that type of thing to be in future presentations. Um, I plan to show how you can bring external data into the service manager data warehouse using some of the stuff that we saw today. And one of the first things I want to dem uh, demonstrate is how you could bring operations manager events and performance data into the service manager data warehouse and cube it up. So I, I will do like a, an example of how to do that. And then uh, we are actually making progress in that direction in terms of including more and more data from system center into the data warehouse. Uh, you know, in 2012, we introduced the virtual machine manager connector and the orchestrator connector. So now we're bringing even that data through into the data warehouse. We introduced the config manager and ops manager direct to data warehouse connectors in 2012. And with 2012 SP1, we introduced um, chargeback and chargeback consumes operations manager performance data around virtual machine utilization. So we're actually bringing those performance data samples over into the service manager data warehouse and cubing that up as part of the chargeback cube so that you can get the utilization and, and cost basis data out of that. Awesome. So we're making progress. It's just gonna be one of those things where it's just gonna take time to eventually get everything into the service manager data warehouse. All right. Well said. Okay, uh, we have another question from Ted Hacker. Uh, how can we import an SNMP MIB into SCOM 2012 service pack one? And are there any utilities to help build the related management pack? I figured that one's probably going to Martin. Here's what's going on. They're asking, in essence, <laughs> it's not Dutch, <laughs> but it's Ops Manager it's and it's SNMP related. I would think that might go to the Ops Logics person in the, in, the, in the group here. That would be my thought, at least. Could you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question, please, Amelia? Absolutely. Um, the question is, 
how can we import an SNMP MIB into SCOM 2012 service pack one? And are there any utilities to help build the related management pack? Okay, so to understand the question, it's more about extending the out-of-the-box networking monitoring feature, I guess, and the models we do support out-of-the-box versus the ones we don't. Uh, to start off with, actually, the ones in the product is, are fairly extensive, so mm -hmm. like all the major brands and such. So what I've saw, seen from the field is it's more or less the other models, models that you want to include, and then the M MIB file is like a reference file on what the types of things are that you can monitor. There's no such thing like as an MIB to MP converter or like a wizard in the product to do so. But you could certainly add uh, through the authoring piece of OM uh, extra OIDs or other items of a network device you'd want to uh, start monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would be an authoring experience where you'd start adding those components, I guess. Yeah. Well said. Pretty much what we got at this point. In time. And if you want a reference on www.authoringfriday.com, I started a blog series on how to do it if you're interested about all the tidbits. See, I pointed to the right one. It wasn't even a Dutch question. This time. The blog is in Dutch, no, sorry. It's actually very makkelijk in Nederland, so then we have it in Nederlands handled. Good to know. Yeah, that one. All right, Amelia, what's our next question? Okay, Not in ne Dutch. All right, this question is for Chris. Um, with Service Manager, how often do the cubes run? Does SCOM performance data for multiple MGs get passed into Service Manager for cube reporting? Multiple management groups. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. So first part of that, how often does, or how often do the cubes process? And it depends. Mm -hmm. Uh, really on the version of SQL that you have installed. So if you're running SQL Server standard, it's once a day. I want to say the default is like 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. Uh, if you've got enterprise, you can do some more advanced tweaks to have it run multiple times a day. Uh, and then the second part of that question again, Amelia? Yes. Uh, does SCOM performance data from multiple MGs get passed into Service Manager for Cube reporting? So in essence, can you send in multiple SCOM management groups and have them report into Service Manager and be cubed for reporting? Yeah, I, I don't see why not. It's just multiple yeah. connectors, I assume, right? Yep. Multiple so, connectors, uh, and yeah, bring in the data warehouse. You're good to go. All right, we got a thumbs up from Travis on that as well. So that sounds like a that sounds like a pretty solid answer. All right. Yes. Okay, and what Pete is saying there off mic right now is enough juice to be able to handle all that processing. So do you want to drop those numbers or do we just want to leave uh, it vague? <laughs> that would be a job for server and SQL 2012. All right. Well said. Unless they throw a follow-up tweet asking details, we're going to roll on that one. All right. What's next? All right. This hold one. On. Hold on. Hold on. Let's add on to that one. Go ahead. One second, Amelia. If you're using Service Manager and you're doing the data warehouse, just install Enterprise Edition and save yourself the trouble. That's yeah. all I got to say. <laughs> well, it processes the data differently. So it's, <coughs> sorry. Uh, you know, if you're processing uh, with SQL Server standard, it's going to process the entire cube nightly versus, what is it, incremental uh, process in enterprise. So that's, that's the big difference. And all that fancy stuff you saw from Travis's presentation with cube reporting, uh, generally speaking, Enterprise Edition is the flavor to go. And Travis is reaching, so maybe he's going to slap me. But. No, I, I would just point out that um, we think we fixed the issue with um, SQL standard in SP1. So we think okay. now, even with standard, it'll do an incremental process of the cube instead of a full process. Nice. So um, I have yet to hear that be confirmed by a customer that was having that problem prior to SP1, but yeah. we did look at it and hope we fixed it. Awesome. Excellent. All right, Amelia, what do we got? Okay, our next question is for Wally. Um, what do you see as the consequences consumerization and BYOD have on personal privacy and intellectual property? Wow. Uh, <laughs> how is that a Wally question? Wally um, Mead, Esquire. In, into now part of Config Manager. Yeah, but that, um, <laughs> that still is not a Wally question or an Into question. That's, a, that's a, where the mark is going. Um, certainly, you're bringing your own device in, so. Um, you have the aspect of you're putting potentially company data on that device when they access your company resources. And you are deploying potentially company-based applications out there, which are available, so not required to be put down on the device. But 
And that's why we gave you in that Windows Intune connector the ability of putting privacy, uh, a URL to privacy documentation on your intranet so that you can point to those people when they're enrolling where they can go to find that type of data to see what the ramifications may be. But it's purely just that. Um, on the, and then on the other end, like Dan was saying, that once you retire a device, we block you from running any applications or uninstall the applications that got installed from the company apps portal, so they're not available anymore. But you still have your, your own data there. So uh, potential for applications getting out there than not being able to use them anymore. Okay. Right. And Jason wants to add in, too. Yeah. Jason should have been there for that one. We should have moved. <laughs> All right, we got. How many more do you think we've got here? Because if possible, we may want to pull one or two out of the out of the audience if people have ones here that they haven't tweeted in. We've so. got one left. If we want to take this one and then pull the audience. That's awesome. All right. Um, this one just came in from Eric Vandebrink. Hosting a web server on Azure, can it connect direct from the internet, or does it connect like ISP to HQ to VPN HQ to Azure to web server? And I'll retweet that so you can see it spelled yeah. out. <laughs> no, I mean, so <clears throat> there's, there's kind of two ways to web server in Azure. One would be to have a web role, or actually there's three because we now have websites, Windows Azure websites. Uh, essentially, the, the, what it sounds like here is you're asking the question particularly as it relates to having uh, Windows Azure virtual networking installed. If you're accessing the web server itself and like it's a public website like joeysnow.com or whatever it is, you're gonna go out through the internet for that traffic. The same thing if it was like an intranet, you would resolve to the internal network and, and get inside that way. So if you're running it, say, on IIS inside of uh, Windows Azure Infrastructure as a Service or Windows Azure Virtual Machine, not that that would be really the, re the recommended way at this point because there's other options for website hosting uh, inside of Windows Azure. It, if it was an intranet and, you, and it's only internal, you're gonna go through the Windows Azure Virtual Network Connection. If it's an externally available one, you're just gonna go out to the public internet and into Windows Azure. So that should answer that question there. All right. Good stuff, thank you. All right, so in the audience, unless we have anything else that just came in. Uh, so in the audience, does anybody have a barn burner question that they wanted to ask and they didn't feel either like tweeting it or hadn't gotten it in yet? No hands is okay as well. It's really hard to see up here to see if anybody does. Oh, we have one hand up. There we go. And we have one over here. So, Hi. I was wondering how Windows to Go and or how Configuration Manager handles Windows to Go and bring your own device scenario when it could move from device to, to the device as far as inventory data. Okay. So question around Windows to Go probably for Wally. Well, it's just going to... Um, uh, Two, two ways you can handle it. You can actually have it lock out the um, local hard drive so you wouldn't be able to read anything off the local hard drive. You can do that through policies with Windows to go. So it would just be able to do inventory off of the stick itself um, and then access the, you know, the rest of the resources on the computer, so the processor, et cetera. Um, so if you're then moving that stick around to different devices, then they'll all get inventoried uniquely um, and you have updated data for that. But it's it's just like any other device. We treat it just like a regular Windows laptop running Windows 8. Um, just that you can with Windows to go with the group policies, you can disable the local hard drive access so it's running all locally off the drive, uh, the USB stick, and then whatever resources you have through the other hardware on the box. And just to add on, by default, when you launch Windows to go, that local hard drive is not available. So you actually have to enable that to, to even be seen. It's, it's disabled by default. It's not going to see it. Well, from a licensing perspective, would it count as an additional license if you move from a machine to machine to machine from an asset? Uh, no, ITAM no. Windows, Windows to go through, you know, and it's only an enterprise feature. It's only available through through Windows 8 Enterprise. That's the license, right? It's it's the stick. Okay. So, I, I, and I think the big thing, I, I, maybe I didn't clarify it enough in the beginning. Windows to go, it's you, you treat the USB stick as the device, right? That's what that's really what it is. It's doesn't really matter what it's being plugged into, so to speak. That's just the processor underneath it that's running it. But the Windows and everything else that's on it, particularly if you've got data on it or anything else, you'd protect that just like you would a normal PC, BitLocker, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, and for licensing, the way I treat the licensing is it's just like a DVD, a movie. You can play it on one 
um, DVD player, you can move it over to a different Blu-ray player and you haven't violated your time. licensing with it. You only play, put it one place at a time. So same thing with your USB stick, when does it go? Oh, hold on one second. We will go ahead and grab just the last question here. Uh, my semi AV guy's waving, but I think we could probably get one last quick one in here a little bit over the radar screen. So last question of the night. Yeah. Are you ever going to allow the surfacing of the alert in a distributed application to roll up alert from the lower level monitor? Okay, so in essence, um, your question you're asking is, we build the distributed application and operations manager. It has multiple disparate levels associated with it. We can generate an alert. Uh, so as an example, we're monitoring a website with a series of different web servers, and we have an error at the bottom level. We can alert off those individually at the bottom level, or we can alert off the top level the impact of the overall health state of that distributed application. But you're saying we can't alert off of, oh, I understand what you're saying now. So in essence, what you're saying is you want to alert off the top level, but you want to have the context of this is what actually caused the problem down at the bottom level associated with it. Yes. That's a deep ops question. So let me, I'm seeing Pete looking like he might have an answer of some form here. Well, so at the end of the day with a distributed application, the challenge you have there is the component groups aren't hosted by the parent. You know, it's a visual representation. So really, if you flip the alert, the alert switch to one at the top, you're going to open that alert and basically generate your diagram view and use the problem, the problem path to visualize where the cause is. I mean, so, that's, that's my two cents. Does anybody else have a, a way to, to float that up? I don't know that there is a way to float it up. I think it's against kind of the architecture of kind of how the class structure works in essence. So we've got an alert that really occurred down here that caused a problem up here. We're notifying from up here, but we don't really know the context that we came from down here. So I think it's a good question. It would be nice to have it, but I think the only viable approach that we use is to be able to get the alert, open up the distributed application, and problem path down to the root cause associated with it. So, so Martin whispered in Dutch that you know we might use live maps to, to extend that visually oh. and, and maybe make that a little more obvious. Okay, that's a good approach. So yeah, that may be a good question to field to the live maps guys and uh, talk to them about it tonight. So well, we have already gone over. We've got one more question we've just got to do though. Okay, what's our it's one more really question? a really good one. Right. Okay, so um, it is, oh, thank you. Thanks, Rod. Okay, from John Nelson. Do we really need to pay differently for orchestrator depending on what it does? Our Microsoft people say we pay per client it touches. I think that starts with Pete, maybe, or over here. You, got, you know a little bit? You want to take it? He's got, yeah, go ahead and hand down the mic there. So, again, you should probably contact a salesperson, a person you buy your license from. But from what I understand, the way the System Center licensing is broken up, if you buy one license of SCOM, SCSM, DPM, or Orchestrator, you then own each of those relative products. So let's say you're going for SCOM and you buy one server license. You now have one server license for DPM, SCSM, and Orchestrator. And that goes for the entire server side of it, both standard and enterprise, as well as for the cows at the other end as well. So SCSM being the other example, let's say I'm doing an SCSM implementation and I have two servers and I have 3,000 nodes. Now I own two server licenses and 3,000 cows. That can be transferred over to SCOM. So it's transparent because the actual license can be de duplicated across those four, but it's only those four. Once you step outside of that ecosystem, it then is new licensing. Again, don't quote me on that. I'm not, well, that's what I understand. Yeah, so we okay. were just talking about that. Do you have this one in hand or can I? Yeah, so at the end of the day, at the end of the day, as I understand it, and, and, and as, as my man to the right here said, you, know, you want to, I know your name. And your, love of, and your love of the beach and open-toed sandals, but well, that's, that's for another time. Um, so, as, so as I understand it, you know, even though orchestrator is agentless, you're going to pay for what you touch. So if I'm running, uh, if I have a run book that's executing and touching 30,000 desktops, I better have an eCal out there because I'm touching those nodes. If I'm playing to the letter of the law, but talk to your, talk to your reps, but that's what's stuck in my head from a sticky situation a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So, um, let me clarify one thing on this because this, this is something that people get caught up on often. There's touching directly and there's indirect touching. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> this is direct touching. <laughs> wow. That's going to be a quote. Hold on. <laughs> okay. All right. I thought they liked that in, the, in the Netherlands. No? <laughs> um, so, 
if your orchestrator run book is directly touching a client and, and making that client do something, then you do need to have that client covered by an eCal. If you are running an orchestrator run book, which is calling into ops manager and triggering a runtime task that's passed down to the agent that's running on that client, you do not. That's an indirect touch. And uh, you know, similarly, if you're doing something through, I don't know, maybe PowerShell 3.0 or you know, any of those sorts of things where you're like indirectly touching that client, you don't need to have. Another example would be config manager. Like if you call into config manager and say push an application to that client, that's an indirect touch. You don't have to have a license for that. All right, hold on. Can we can we call her really really quick? Because they're telling me we're way over. You at know this that uh, agreement that you guys don't read and it's 50 pages long and says okay, that says indirect and direct touching in there. You guys are agreeing to that on the fly. All right. Good to know on that one. We got to let that one go for a second before. Hold on. We can't let everybody leave here. So um, so let me go ahead and uh, close things up, wrap things up here. So first off, I wanted to do a big thank you to all of our sponsors. So to the crew at Catapult for all of their hard work to put this together. All right. To Microsoft, who we could not have done it without this event and, and just can't do it without Microsoft. They're awesome. All right. To the crew at Cyrusen here, who have done a phenomenal job and have had a real good sense of humor as we've continued to give him grief throughout the day. He's awesome about that. Thanks so. for the shout out, guys. Yes, and the shout outs over here. To the crew at Veeam, sponsorship on that, much appreciated. There you go. Two more. Thank you for lunch. Yes. Uh, to OpsLogix, um, the crew at OpsLogix, uh, for their assistance as well. And finally, to SA Vision as our sponsors as well. So thanks to all of the above. So thank you all. All right, to our presenters, those that are up here right now, thank you all. This has been a phenomenal event. It's been really instructional. Great speakers across the board today. Really instructive, really dynamic, truly appreciated. So a quick round of thanks to that. All right, and of course, to everybody in the audience here on premise in the Irving location, and I'll go ahead and throw that out worldwide to the rest of our groups that are out there right now. So huge thanks across the board, worldwide attendance. So thank you. All right, I have one last thing to say before we actually shut off the live feed that we're going to be doing, which is an announcement um, that System Center Universe uh, 2014 has been announced from a location perspective. Survey says, all right. Houston, Texas, 2014, will be the home for System Center Universe. So, shout out to the guys in Houston. Got a lot of people attending there this year. So, with that, we're going to go ahead and shut off the feed. And they're going to give me the... Uh, we're good there. All right, so we're shut off on the feed at this point in time. So, what we have left is the drawing associated with the MMS 